So today uh, we're going to talk about uncooled microbolometer technology and UAV integration. Um, just a quick background. We've been doing this since the late 1990s, uh, putting uncooled microbolometer cameras on early, early, early drones that crashed far more often than actually flew. So it's always been a twinkle in our eye and it's quite a, quite a, quite a, a, a feat to see these things uh, used so commonly now. And so we'll go through uh, some of the challenges that uh, we've experienced over the years in uh, putting uh, thermal imagers up in the air. So here's, here, here are the presentation points that I want to cover today. Um, just a quick uh, background, maybe not so much definitions. I'll pick up definitions throughout the talk. Uh, a quick infrared refresher with uh, some overview of microbolometer technology for the portion of attendees that may not be in the infrared business. I'm sure there's a portion of attendees that are in the infrared business. And uh, this will be boring and uh, rote for you guys, but you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but um, I put that in there and we'll breeze through that. Um, talk about some of the basic considerations in integrations of infrared cameras, the evolution of fielded systems that we've seen over the past two decades, uh, a review of the current technologies that are fielded right now, and some of the advanced systems that we see coming down the chute and that we're actually working on right now. Um, I also want to mention that uh, I borrowed from the web uh, liberally for some of the images on this presentation, and I acknowledge all the ownership that's due to the owners of the images. And where appropriate, I've uh, put in actual acknowledgement. So um, infrared imaging, let's talk about infrared imaging. We, we chunk infrared imaging into three categories, short wave, mid wave, and long wave. So um, short wave covers the 0 0.9 to 1.7 micron wavelength band of the electromagnetic spe spectrum. We'll go over that in a little bit more detail. Um, cooled mid wave is generally three to five and uncooled long wave, which is the topic of this talk, is seven to 14 microns, broadly speaking. Uh, there's changes within each one of those windows. So uncooled long wave technology was commercially available probably in the early 90s. It, I'm sure there was research on it in the 80s, but the first um, uncooled long wave, it wasn't a microbolometer back then, um, started in the 1990s. And then what we know today as uncooled microbolometer technology came around around the mid 1990s. Uh, the first units started hitting the market, low resolution, big pixels. Um, Honeywell had a patent that they were licensing out. And, um, you know, it's just grown to the point where microbolometers have taken over the industry. Um, there's some other technologies that pop up every now and again that claim to challenge microbolometers, but they seem to come and go. I'll just leave it at that and not predict what's going to happen in the future. I've heard of other technologies coming, but microbolometers are well established, probably produced uh, close to the million unit mark per year, and um, uh, uh, you know, going to continue to be fielded. And, you know, millions of microbolometers will be out there. Uh, the two technologies are uh, amorphous silicon, you'll hear me speak about that, and vanadium oxide. And we'll go over that um, a little bit more uh, in, in, in future uh, view graphs. So why does anyone want to put infrared in the air? Well, um, primarily it's nighttime imaging. Infrared sees at night, and then uh, in Anytime you want to see heat, it's simple as that. Uh, there are other 
subtle applications that are kind of researchy, but those are the primary reasons you want to see at distance, you want to see at night, and you want to see heat. Those are the basics. Um, infrared refresh. Basically, think of infrared just like any other light. Um, our eyeballs see 400 to 700 nanometers. Infrared, we kind of de define as one micron out to 15 microns. That's the wavelength band that we image. Um, we treat it just like light. It behaves like uh, radiation with a wave, a characteristic wavelength. Uh, it behaves like uh, particles in that it, it, it carries energy. So just like a photon in the visible has energy, it behaves like a particle. It also behaves like a wave. Same thing with infrared. Now, um, our discussion is going to be about uncooled long wave microbolometers, and they're on the long wavelength range of um, where we're speaking now. So 7 to 14 microns is um, the most common microbolometer wavelength band. Some manufacturers define it as 8 to 12, some from 7.5 to 13.5. Um, it all depends upon um, how they define their systems and the spectral band pass that they use for the particular microbolometer that they offer. And, um, you know, whatever requirements come down the chute, they're driven by both the technology available and the demand. Another important issue related to the use of infrared is what can transmit through the atmosphere. So you can see that this is a spectrum of absorption or, or transmittance more accurately. Um, the, uh, the opposite of transmittance is absorption. So you can see that there are characteristic wavelength bands. And you know, we are focusing on this long wavelength band from notionally eight microns down to seven microns, perhaps out to 14 microns. So you can see that we have high transmittance through the atmosphere. You don't hear much about six to eight micron sensors because the atmosphere won't transmit those wavelengths. It's completely absorbed. And then there's uh, mid-wave and short-wave. Both of those transmit through the atmosphere quite well. And there are characteristic absorption points, but those aren't, those are kind of outside of the scope of what we're talking about right now. Um, so just so we know what we're talking about in, in, in infrared imaging, um, I, I like this uh, view graph courtesy of Princeton in, in Infrared in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, so uh, Sierra Olympic defines infrared as a thousand nanometers and longer. Uh, we uh, acknowledge that a portion of the business uh, considers near infrared beyond the visible light, red cut off notionally 750 nanometers, 800 nanometers to a thousand nanometers. That's called near infrared. And there's sensitivity on common CMOS silicon readouts uh, or common CMOS sensors there. We deal strictly with specialty infrared sensors. So sensors that can see beyond that one micron, meaning it, it, it steps into exotic semiconductor and exotic detector lamp. Um, so, uh, that's where we start our definition of infrared imaging. And so, yeah, we're talking about long wave infrared imaging. We saw on the previous graph, the atmospheric window for long wavelength. Um, so there's also short wavelength. Those are generally Indian galley Mars and night sensors. There's other technologies coming along that offer um, short wavelength sensitivity. They're room temperature sensors and generally defined as 900 to 1700 nanometers or 0.9 to 1.7 microns. Um, and then a large portion of our business, but a small portion of the um, overall infrared business is cooled midwave. And that's been around for a long time. Um, and uh, it's, it's the, the complexity of coolers and the complexity of cooling limits their application. They're always very expensive. They're heavier to a point. At some point, they're 
better, and we'll just talk about that down the line. But uh, Midwave is out there as well. And then the graphic there uh, is, is what you see uh, with each one of these cameras. Certainly visible cameras we're all familiar with. When I say visible cameras, it's the same camera that's in your cell phone. Um, and those have sensitivity out to uh, 400 to 700 nanometers for color. Uh, 700 to 1,000 nanometers in near infrared, there's no color there like we're used to, but um, color is limited to uh, you know, 0.7 microns. And then it's another reflective um, image in the shortwave infrared, but again, no color. And there's a lot of characteristic um, absorptions and interesting things happen in the sphere, but that's, that's beyond our talk now. So um, let's just leave it that SWEAR is certainly present. It's, 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 it's important, it's growing. Um, there are uh, uh, UAV applications for SWEAR, um, but beyond the scope of this talk. And then the, the, the next image down, um, right about here, that's a mid-wave image. It looks very much like a long wave image. They're both fundamentally thermal images. Uh, that's where you know the the black body radiation of solid bodies is present, and that's what the cameras pick up. So uh, this mid wave image looks a little different than the long wave image, mostly because mid wave sensors are just more sensitive. They have higher noise equivalent temperature difference um, than long wave sensors in general. But you know that gap is narrowing, and um, you know. Uh, it, there are subtle differences between a long wave and a mid wave image, but you know, again, that's kind of getting into the nitty gritty and let's just focus on long wave imaging for now. Oops. There we go. So uh, some of you may not know what a microbolometer is. So a microbolometer is not a, a photon detector. It's an energy detector. Now, photons carry energy, but what happens is we're actually detecting radiation, we're detecting heat. So energy is focused through a lens onto what you could, what, what, what this thing is called is a microbolometer bridge. It's a suspended fleck of, of material, generally a vanadium oxide or amorphous silicon. And it relies on the characteristic of these two materials, which is thermal coefficient of resistance. So the resistance of the material changes when it changes temperature. So imagine this is a little 12 micron, 10 micron, 17 micron tabletop, so to speak, a little fleck of vanadium oxide or amorphous silicon. And it changes its temperature in a very short period of time due to focused energy through a lens onto that microbolometer bridge. And when you constantly bias in current or voltage and the resistance changes, the converse will change too. So if you're constant in current and the temperature of a microbolometer changes, the resistance of the microbolometer changes, then you can measure the, the, the characteristic change in voltage. And um, those measurements are made on a pixel by pixel basis in what's called the CMOS input cell or the readout integrated circuit. So it's a miracle that these things work at all, to be perfectly honest. If you think about it, you have a little 12 micron fleck of vanadium oxide, it heats up in, 12 milliseconds, and there's a pico voltage or nano voltage or, or a very small change that can be measured and digitized and thus create an image. Um, it's a beautiful technology. It falls into the technology of MEMS, um, micro machined elements. Um, you know, they're very complex manufacturing processes that go into manufacturing these little arrays. 
But if you're familiar with imaging arrays, um, a CMOS imaging array or an old fashioned CCD array, you can extend this to this microbolometer technology in that you, know, you have um, a pixel size and a pixel array and you wind up with a die and then you build a camera out of it. So uh, the first step is that die necessarily has to be packaged. Um, typically it's in a vacuum package. You have to isolate it because it responds to temperature. You somehow have to control the temperature environment. Some of them are tech regulated. Some of them are allowed to float with temperature, but you, they're, they're always behind some kind of window and in some kind of vacuum package. So that's what you see on the lower left. That's a, a typical vacuum package that a microbolometer um, is packaged in. And that's kind of the old fashioned package. Uh, a lot of manufacturers have moved on to wafer level, wafer scale packaging. So a die looks more like just a standard silicon chip, be, chip being diced up out of a wafer. A um, little bit deep for this talk, but um, just keep in mind that it's a small uh, area array that's packaged. You have electrical interfaces, you build electronics behind the uh, sensor, like in the upper right, you put a lens on, uh, on the front of it and you have an infrared imaging core that can send you digital data downstream. Um, there's a lot of intermediate steps going on here. We have to deal with non-uniformity correction, image processing, certainly optical issues uh, in terms of um, F number, uh, durability of coatings, um, focal length, all those things play into a system, but Fundamentally, just think of these microbolometers as a lens, sensor, electronics, and you're off to the races with a camera that you can um, adapt to an airborne application. So that's as far as I wanna go with the infrared refresher, I call it. Now let's talk about airborne considerations. So this is where we've been working for the past 20 years. Um, Honestly, our experience is mostly with fixed wing. And, uh, uh, you know, we started supplying these things in 1999. And the fundamental issue is how high above the ground you want to image your um, above ground level AGL. Certainly, there's an angle. You're never looking straight down. Some, most of the time, you're not looking straight down. So you got an angle that converts it to a slant range. Um, and then, what do you want, uh, you know, what does that footprint on the ground look like? So the horizontal field of view. And then resolution is defined as, you know, what can one pixel see? Uh, fundamentally, from an optics point of view, it's IFOB, which stands for instantaneous field of view. And this is where we start is with a given sensor, with a given pixel and a given mission, what IFOB do we need to achieve uh, you know, per pixel resolution or ground sample distance do we need to see in a system? And that impacts the design of the optics which scales up to size, weight, power, and everything else that's important about getting these things into aircraft. And I touch on this over here, the other considerations are you know, the sensor size, which is nowadays driven by pixel size um, in many respects. You know, the overall weight of the system, weight is primarily driven by optics and focal length that you wanna put up in the air. Um, those all translate in an aircraft to the mission duration. Uh, you know, you can't put too much weight or it won't get off the ground. Or if you're struggling to get the camera off the ground, you're draining your batteries and you're having very short mission life. So all these issues come into design considerations in an infrared camera or an infrared application in the air. And oftentimes, you know, you have to deal with these things, uh, these same considerations with a visible camera, with other sensors, other lasers, other 
items that need to get up into the air. The ground station or the ground link sometimes is important. Sometimes data is stored in the aircraft and downloaded um, after the mission. But um, all of these come into play when um, we contemplate putting any camera in the air, any kind of sensor in the air. Um, cameras in specific, or cameras specifically have to deal with horizontal field of view, optics, everything else. And then, size, weight, power, and translates into, you know, how long the aircraft can fly and what the aircraft is supposed to do. So the mission drives the sensor. So, you know, certainly there's commercial drones, public safety drones, military drones, and commercial drones. Um, cost is a big issue, certainly. They generally have lower operating elevations. They're mostly wide field of view because you're low, uh, lower elevation, you want to cover, you know, the ground, you want to look at a tennis court, you want to look at a soccer field. Think about, you know, if you have an aircraft in the air and you're looking down, what you want to look at, that's, that, that kind of drives the field of view consideration. And most of the time, they're fixed field of view. You pick one optic, you're flying it on a commercial drone, and you have a single field of view. You, you, you can easily accomplish the zoom function with flying closer or flying further away. So we don't often see in commercial drones the complexity of zoom optics. It's not unheard of, but it's um, fixed field of view services 99% of the applications. So single field of view, um, uh, optics, and you know we'll talk about that uh, going forward. So um, public safety is another important application. You know, firefighters, police. Again, it's situational awareness, and you know there are more challenging emis uh, missions where you know more complex systems can be applied. And then in military drones, you know, honestly, that's been our history for the past twenty years. Um, it's always driven by mission. Um, there's so many elements in there. We've used uncooled and cooled micro, uh, uncooled and cooled sensors for a long time. Uh, elements of stealth, undetectability, distance. You know the, how far away you want to be from whatever you want to image. Um, size, weight, power uh, translates into mission duration. Nobody wants to fly a military aircraft that's only going to last for 20 minutes. So, you know, we're focused on size, weight, power. And, um, you know, certainly there are fixed field of view and zoom elements in, uh, across the military drones. And, you know, uh, the military drones do pay attention to the cool technology for some of its uh, applications. That's, that's aside from this discussion. And there's a lot of resolution driven evolution right now. We've been um, dealing with relatively low resolution compared to the visible world, but the infrared is starting to improve resolution and resolution is driving a lot of new technology these days. And we'll talk about that later. Um, then there's always a universal consideration. How do you point it and how do you stabilize it? So we're talking about microbolometers. There's another part of this business and that you got to point it and you got to stabilize it. And I'll touch on that as well. Um, so I've, I've used this uh, picture for a while and you know, certainly this goes to the point of why cooled technology and, and why cooled technology is present and uncooled technology reaches its limits. And it has everything to do with the size of the optics. On the right, you see a long wavelength that gives you a 76 micro radian um, pixel, which is approximately a three degree horizontal field of view. Uh, on the left, what you see is a mid wave sensor um, that gives you a 54 micro radian pixel and about a two degree horizontal field of view. These are VGA resolution um, uh, capabilities. So 64482 degrees, 64483 degrees. In the uncooled world, 
you're dealing with an optic that drives your weight up to four and a half kilograms and it'll crash more most aircraft most aircraft won't get off the ground most small aircraft won't get off the ground with a four and a half kilogram infrared imager but they can get off the ground with a 120 gram imager a 1.2 kilogram imager and so there is a crossover point where uncooled microbolometers reach their limit it has to do with distance it has to do with focal length of the optic and the size and weight of the optic. And you'll eventually, if you're looking at distance, um, you'll have to choose mid-wave to achieve your mission goal versus long wave at, at some distance. And just a, a, a picture of the difference between the two technologies. This is 10-year-old technology right now. So the mid-wave has come down a lot in size since that time, whereas the microbolometer is nothing you can do about that aperture size. The, the F number of the lens drives the size of the front element, and eventually you'll have a system that's far too heavy. So um, the infrared world has tracked resolutions forever. Um, started in the early, uh, uh, or the late 90s with 160 by 120, and we've gone up to uh, 640 by 480. So, um, you know, an example of early, early technology that we were dealing with. 2003, you see the sensors on the right, um, a bit larger than six, um, six uh, or, or 160 by 120, but still the improvement four times the pixels makes a big difference in the image. And every time there was a step up in resolution, um, we were there in, on, on airborne systems. Um, by 2004, VGA was around and common. Um, and what you see on the bottom there, the right two sensors were attempts that we had to do zoom on a 320 by 240. And then the far left sensor is what we wound up with, which was a 640-480. And we found that um, we could just have a 640-480 um, fixed field of view and accomplish all our goals in vintage 2004 aircraft. Uh, on the right, you see a gimbal implementation there, and we were flying them on Scan Eagle aircraft um, behind a polyethylene dome um, on the front of that aircraft. You can kind of make out what the... Um, what the, what the camera looked like or what the uh, imager looked like on that fixed wing aircraft. And this is way before multi-rotors. I mean, this was 10 years before, well, no, not 10 years, eight years before DJI ever came out with a multi-rotor. Uh, nowadays, okay, you know, you get incredibly uh, elevated systems. Uh, on the left is the smallest uh, gimbal system that I see right now with a uh, infrared and a visible sensor. That's, that's a 320 by 240 class, but you know, next to a standard writing pen, you can see how small a gimbal can be um, with a thermal and a, um, and a, uh, um, a visible sensor. And that's that's a product by Vantage Robotics in California. And then um, the, on the right is a pretty elevated uh, EOIR system with a rangefinder from DJI. Um, on the left, you have a continuous zoom visible. On the right, a fixed field of view thermal. So those are two of the most highly elevated you know, kind of commercial class um, gimbal systems that you can get right now with fixed field of view, uncooled microbolometer systems. When you move on to um, longer focal length and uh, certainly cooled systems, you move on to these big gimbals. We're all familiar with these big gimbals. Um, stabilization becomes important as you get longer and longer focal lengths. You know, if you vibrate, you vibrate. Uh, if you have vibrations at the at the gimbal, you have vibrations at the pixel. And 
you can only do so much in electronic destabilization. Certainly, there's a point where elevated um, stabilization becomes very important. Um, and you know, the item on the left is a six inch kind of mid wave gimbal. The item on the right is about a 14 inch. But um, highly elevated systems there, sometimes drones, sometimes um, uh, manned aircraft. So how, let's get back to microbolometers. There's tons of work going on right now with fixed field of view microbolometers. Um, just pick a couple. You know, these are flying on commercial drones. Um, they uh, are used in electrical inspection, roof inspection, solar cells, public safety. Couple pictures from FLIR, you know, nice picture of a solar um, a PV solar plant with some hot spots on those PV cells that you can see. Uh, works well, a great company out of um, Czech Republic, I believe. Uh, that's an obvious fault in the roof. So just Beautiful applications for fixed field of view, highly capable, small, uncooled, long wave imagers from the air. And here's, you know, right now we're dealing with very small systems that are, you know, it's almost, I don't want to call them commodities, but, but they're widely available from a number of sensors. Um, Fields of view, you can get 10 degrees to 90 degrees. The sweet spot is about 25 to 50 degrees for the commercial applications. Um, VGA resolution is common now, but there's still QVGA resolutions. And the biggest thing that's happening now is pixel size reduction. We've already, you know, 12 micron pixels are common, 10 micron pixels are commercially available. And in the long wave world, we're not gonna get much lower than that because the wavelength of light is about 10 microns. You don't want a pixel smaller than the wavelength of light. Um, and, you know, so, so we're getting very small. These are, these are great examples of some of the small systems we've seen in our plant. Um, now there's some specialized systems. Um, you know, I've mentioned that long wave cameras can be specialized. Um, we have zoom systems. You can see how small we can build a microbolometer camera with a zoom element in front of it. Um, notionally goes from 30 degrees to six degrees and you know, see humans at two and a half kilometers. Yesterday, it was rainy, it was cold in Hood River. So uh, collected some low contrast images, but easily display the zoom capability of a camera like that going from 30 degrees to six degree horizontal field of view. Certainly opens up the range of possibilities, but you know you, you suffer with weight. You can see how much bigger that system is than a typical fixed field of view. So what's coming down the chute? Um, next thing in our world is gonna be 1280. That's called HD long wave. HD is 720p. So uh, 720p is 1280 by 720. And we have sensors now in shop and we're working on camera concepts right now um, with 1280, 1024, 10 micron pixels. So these have just flipped over to producibility. They have very high sensitivity. And the beauty of the 10 micron pixel is that it opens up a range of standard commercial off-the-shelf infrared optics. So you don't want your F number to climb too much. We're sticking to F1, F1.2 at the max with a 10 micron pixel, but we have uh, a, a, a range of lenses that we can use right now without having to go custom. So this is, this is new technology. We expect it to be in a prototype form by the end of the year and, you know, certainly commercial availability next year sometime, 2022. Um, what does that buy you per unit size, per unit volume? Think of it as a wider field of view. So, you know, you're not getting um, better resolution per unit optical aperture. You're just getting greater situational awareness, which is important, um, greater situational awareness um, not looking through a straw, getting more pixels, a wider field of view. What you see here is a 640 superimposed on a 1280 image. So 
I was doing side-by-side -side comparisons of the two, approximately the same IFOVs. And, you know, you just see a wider range of image. And that's the benefit of uh, HD. So you're not always looking through a soda straw with a narrow field of view application. Now, the other specialty uncooled that we're working on right now is full HD. Full HD is called 1080p, 1920 by 1080. Uh, when you plug in, you know, this is before 4K TV came along, but um, uh, right now, infrared is up to 1080p. So our sensor resolution here is 1920 by 1200 by 12 microns. Right now, we've had a full featured camera um, with USB and IP digital, uh, HDSDI or HDSDI. These are 60 hertz operation. Um, the problem with these is the optics are all custom. There's no commercial off the shelf optics for this sensor. So we have limited optics, but we're ticking off a number of optics as we go. Um, certainly we have uh, uh, 50 degree and 25 degree and other optics will come along as uh, budget and time allows. Um, now, I still think that sooner or later, these will have wide commercial use, but um, it's going to be wide field of view applications. The fact of the matter is you, you, the optics to get narrow field of view on this big of a sensor turn into really big optics. The, the, they're not going to fly. That's the bottom line, um, unless you're on a manned aircraft and you really need massive zoom on a full HD long wave. Sooner or later, that's going to become impractical because of the size of the optic. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the beauty of these sensors, you get a wide field of view with tons of information, you know, 2.7 million pixels. It's starting to become interesting for, um, in, you know, the most advanced processors that you can put behind these cameras. So from here, I think we're just moving on to some sample video from Full HD. Um, and it's interesting, the, this, is, this is from a manned rotary uh, uh, aircraft where we installed it into a giant gimbal. So we had per, almost perfect stability and you know, we could go up to high elevations, but it's just remarkable how you see each one of those specs that look like ants. Those are, those are individually resolved automobiles from about, I think this is about 8,000 feet. So you can see some remarkable resolution with a full HD um, sensor here. And this only goes on for about a minute, I think. Um, and uh, again, this was a uh, manned aircraft. This is flying over Los Angeles. The, the, the atmosphere is hazy. It's, it's a warm summer day on, on, on that video as well. Um, now the next video has music, I warn you. Um, I don't know what, what your volume is turned up to, but we'll see how this plays out and if it even shows up on your video. Um, but again, this is, this is more full HD. This is more full HD that you can see um, from a manned aircraft. Uh, and again, this was one of our cameras in a special integration with one of the uh, you know, most sought after uh, cinema, cinema gimbals that, that, that you can get. And, um, we had this contract with NASA to, to fly over Los Angeles. Um, I think it was two summers ago with some of our full HD sensors. So, you know, some of the best thermal imagery I've ever seen at night. Um, and I've seen a lot of thermal imagery. So we're very pleased with this camera and um, it's uh, finding a lot of applications and a lot of interest from a lot of customers. So that's kind of the conclusion of the talk. I want to thank you again for your attendance. Um, again, thank you for or the organiz organizing entities here. And um, as usual, if you need to reach us, our website is sierralympic.com.
Um, Chris, I do have one question here. If you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, okay, the question is, we're always looking for very small swab Lware imagers for UAV applications. How would you compare your Lware imagers to those of your competitors? For example, FLIR Boson 640. So we 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 buy FLIR, we buy BAE, we bought some Chinese sensors, we have DRS sensors. So each one has its own strengths, um, and uh, certainly we have data supporting which are the most sensitive. We have extensive measurement capabilities here at Sierra Olympic laboratories full of black bodies and collimators and talented engineers. And, you know, we will just have to discuss, um, you know, individual requirements to determine which is the best sensor. Okay. A couple more questions. Um, one has come in and it's a multi-part question. So what drives spectral range performance of a microbolometer detector is the first part. Is it driven primarily by the spectral range of the optics used in the system? If we use an optic that provides broadband performance, say five to 50 microns, could we expect the microbolometer to respond to energy from this spectral range? The answer is typically no. Uh, most microbolometer manufacturers Define their spectral window with uh, spectral window by the by the coating on the cover glass of the FPA package, and the cover glass has AR coatings designed for eight to twelve, for seven and a half to thirteen, for seven to fourteen, whatever individual um, manufacturer selects for its cover glass. Now, some manufacturers will reluctantly produce uh, sensors with custom windows on them. Uh, and, uh, but that gets very complex. It gets very expensive uh, because uh, most microbolometers are produced in a factory setting. Any kind of changes in a manufacturing setting, especially in an aerospace company where most of these sensors come from involve enormous um, costs related to quality controls. And, um, you know, the bottom line is, is if you can buy a hundred of them, we can work on projects like that. If you want to buy one, it's almost impossible because you just can't get one special microbolometer with um, broadband sensitivity. Most of them are going to be optimized for eight to 12 microns or thereabouts. Okay. Um, let's see, here's another question. I think it came in about two minutes ago. I think it's referring to the footage that was shown at the end. Can you say something about the response time of the sensor? Is it improved relative to older sensors in particular when imaging fast changing scenes? No, microbolometers are still using response times of about um, you know, 11 to 13 milliseconds for terrestrial imaging, you know, minus 40 to plus 80 Celsius uh, scene ranges. Some build, I've seen cameras and we do have some specialty cameras that shortens the response time to about four milliseconds, but then the consequence is you have less sensitivity, and those are generally designed for imaging higher temperature objects, notionally from 50 Celsius up to maybe 400 Celsius, something like that. So what you can't get is terrestrial temperatures with shorter response times and good sensitivity. So that's not much has changed in microbolometers from that point. Okay, the next question is, how does hysteresis impact microbolometer performance? Hysteresis? So hysteresis, uh, we think of hysteresis in optics, um, and you're welcome to email me specifically if there's a difference 
in hysteresis in microbolometers, what specifically? Um, there is an effect of hysteresis, not much detectable at the glass to glass level. In an optic level, we deal with hysteresis uh, with focus and zoom all the time. Um, and that has to do with how well we can run autofocus uh, routines. But you know, specific hysteresis in a microbolometer, um, we don't see much of it in uh, uh, you know, glass to glass interactions. Okay. I see it looks like what is the last question? Is a radiometric imager a matter of calibration with standard LWER sensor or are there differences in the hardware? So, yeah, we do have radiometric sensors. They're limited and usually there are limited optics that are suitable for radiometric calibration. Um, you know, we have uh, radiometric products on our website, both uh, small and large, you know, small for integration and large for uh, laboratory use. Um, and uh, radi uh, radiometric calibration is an apparent temperature. It's a translation from whatever uh, radiance from a surface is being emitted, transmitted through the air, corrected for radiometric constants like absorption and emissivity, and then calculated through to a temperature value. But we have, we, we have good products that do a good job there. And you know, there's always a precision um, value that you have to deal with. So uh, again, those are on our website and we deal with radiometric calibration all the time. <laughs>